What's going on guys? So I always hear, Felix, how is this any different than what happened in 2017? We always talk about that 2017, the ICO bubble burst and crypto went into this long crypto winter. And essentially many people think that crypto was over ever since. But how come the price are coming back? How is it possible that Bitcoin is climbing out of its gutter, hitting $3,000, now back to $13,000, shooting for what many people think is a new bull market with new all-time highs? Well, we have to really break down what has changed since 2017. And as we peel back the layers, you will realize that 2020 has nothing to do with how 2017 was run. And in fact, things have gotten a lot better. So let's dive right in. Number one, the thing that really separates 2020 from 2017 is that finally products are shipping. Okay, so back in 2017, the crypto landscape looked something like this. Some stranger on the internet had an idea. What if we put supply chain on the blockchain? What if we put the medical space on the blockchain? Or what if we put McDonald's on the blockchain? It was really stupid. Back in 2017, anybody with a half-ass idea was able to, you know, draft up some white paper, slap it on a Squarespace website, and raise millions of dollars with it. Why? Because all the money in the world was flowing into anything with the word blockchain in it. In fact, we saw this happen when Long Island Iced Tea, an iced tea company, renamed itself to Long Island Blockchain. And all of a sudden, their stock went up like 300%. Okay, so 2017 was all about ideas and promises and a lot of talk. Meanwhile, over the coming years, the interesting thing that happened in January and February of 2018, ICOs were still raising about $2 billion a month. Okay, and then as the months progressed, fewer and fewer and fewer dollars kept going into crypto. In fact, by the end of the year, all the different crypto projects combined only raised about perhaps $30 million a month. Right, so that number declined by a factor of about 100x. So as less money came into the industry, less BS project kept getting funded. So ultimately what ended up happening is that only the legit builders, the people that actually wanted to deliver on their promises stuck around and all of the talkers, all of the scam artists, all the frauds got filtered out. Okay, and then to take this up further, even though there was a lot of really bad apples, back in 2017, there was also plenty of legitimate entrepreneurs that came here to build, that truly believed in the decentralization revolution. And what ends up happening is if you combine talent with billions of dollars of venture funding and you give them some time, like for example, say three years of bear market, you end up coming out with incredible products. So while 2017 was known for a lot of promises and white paper dreams, we now have real life products and we are seeing an avalanche of them, right? So you see number one, of course, E2.0 about to launch, but let's forget about the words that say about. Let's just focus on what's actually launched. We have Compound, we've got Aave, we have Maker, we've got Melon, you've got the entire DeFi ecosystem and universe that you and I can use today to get a decentralized loan, set up a decentralized fund, do decentralized swaps, right? Right now, Uniswap is doing more volume than most of decentralized players out there. So truly, we've gone from these ideas and dreams to real world products with real execution. That is the number one biggest difference between 2017 and 2020. But let's dive deeper. Number two, users. Now it's great having an amazing product, but it really is of no value having an amazing product that nobody wants. So what we saw happen in 2020 is this explosion of usage, because even though we've had DEXs, decentralized exchanges for quite a while, Right When you look at the graphs of how the volume on these exchanges is changing, right about February and March, we started seeing a significant uptick where the usage started to double almost every single month. And we've went from being about flat on decentralized exchanges to going vertical, parabolic on almost any decentralized exchange. We've seen Kyber take off, Uniswap take off, Balancer take off, Zero X, you name it. Almost all of the AMM pools have really dominated. So almost on any single measurement, whether that's Texas, whether that's decentralized funds like Melon, whether that's even Bitcoin users, how many people have wallets? 
every single fundamental statistic essentially on the crypto ecosystem has gone significantly bullish already towards the end of 2019. And this is where I became very, very bullish on the space because while I saw prices kept declining, I also noted that almost every single fundamental data point started going up and making higher highs even. We saw security like hash power going higher. We saw number of wallets going higher. We saw TBL in DeFi going higher. Everything started going higher. And here's the truth. When it comes to fundamental investing, sometimes the price lags. Sometimes the price front runs fundamentals. But at the end of the day, when you zoom out long enough to a long enough time horizon, fundamentals always catch up. If, of course, they're tied into token value. But it stands to reason that if a token accrues value by how many transactions they, for example, do in a DEX, then if the DEX starts blowing up, having more and more users, it's only going to take so long until the token also accrues in value. Number three interoperability. Now we made a separate video that you might find here somewhere where we talked about composability versus interoperability. Back in 2017, what we noticed is that almost every single project worked in a silo, right? 2017 was all about the smart contract wars. You fed Ethereum, you fed NEO, you fed EOS, you fed Stellar, you fed Cardano, you fed all these players trying to you know, become the next smart contract platform. You fed all these platforms trying to become Web 3.0 players. And they all were competitors where the work that was done on Cardano was not helping the work that was being done on Ethereum. Now we've progressed a lot from that. And in 2020, most of the focus, most of the development power is all happening on top of Ethereum, which leads to a lot of interoperability on top of Ethereum. So what we see is that we have the compound team, for example, being able to use DAI, which was made from Maker. Meanwhile, we see Melon, the decentralized asset management protocol, for example, use Kyber Network, Uniswap, CRX. We see all these different players work together to create some truly amazing products. And that's when we really hit that escape velocity because everything accelerates when you're able to tap into the work of others, where you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time, where not everybody is chasing to build the same piece, but rather we're building this massive, beautiful puzzle, this mosaic, where one person contributes something, somebody contributes something else, and it keeps growing and expanding and it all interacts. And that truly really is the beauty and the power of open source technologies like the entire crypto ecosystem. And that's what it's allowing it right now to take off so much because where in the past we all chased the same goals, now there's hundreds of projects, thousands of projects, all pursuing different little niches from governance to insurance, to gaming, to NFTs, to asset management, DEXs, derivatives, you name it. And ultimately, we can create some really exciting products that combine many of these players. And that is also what makes it so incredibly different from the dreams and the ideas and the almost cutthroat environment that we had in 2017, where everybody's just trying to become the next Ethereum. Number four, the institutions are taking note. Look, one of the most famous headlines back in 2017 was where Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, said that Bitcoin is a fraud. And then this year, JP Morgan came around saying that, you know, Bitcoin could significantly outperform gold as it might be the best hard asset. So all these institutions have turned a full 180 and really come back to recognize and realize that, you know what, we can talk all the shit that we want about Bitcoin and decentralized assets, but the truth is they are the future. So we can keep hating on them or we can partake in them. So while 2017 was all fighting it, ultimately now they're joining. And as the old saying goes, first they ignore you, right? That was perhaps 2010 to 2014. Then they laugh at you. That was perhaps 2014 till 2017. Then they fight you which was perhaps 2017, you could say till now, but ultimately they join you and you win. And I think this is really the phase that we're slowly entering where the ridicule has ended. The fighting is slowly coming to stop. And instead what we're seeing is we're seeing cooperation with policymakers and we're seeing big companies like PayPal, like Square joining in the fight instead of trying to shut it down. 
So this fact that we see the institutions now no longer pushing back or ridiculing, but instead joining the fight is making digital assets really incredibly defensible and almost near immortal because now to fight digital assets, you also have to fight some major, major players, some billion dollar entities that have the legal departments, that have the backing to really push back, right? It was easy to stomp on Bitcoin when you know there was very few players with small war chests. But now those war chests are growing and our legal departments all around crypto, whether it's the Coinbase legal department, the Binance legal department, you name it, has enough firepower to truly put up a fight where that was simply not a reality in the past. And the way it looks is this is really just a start, right? We see more and more asset allocators investing in digital assets like Bitcoin. We see more and more payment processors like Square and PayPal pull the trigger. So ultimately, this is just the beginning of the wave. And that is something we did not see in 2017. And last but not least, number five, the space has overall become significantly more sophisticated. We've gone from a group of philosophers to a group of really more tech-oriented leaders that focus on the application of how it's actually being used. There's a lot of credit to give to the early Bitcoin founders and leaders in the space. But ultimately, what we notice is that in the early years, a lot of the Bitcoin community, a lot of the decentralization community was focused a lot more around the philosophical outcomes of decentralization. And those were important discussions to be had because ultimately it was that vision, it was that those ideas that really created that fire that brought so many people into this industry. Right. But whereas we saw the peak of all of this sentiment really was shown in the whole ICO mania, because that was the peak of, you know, philosophical capital raising. Now we've come a lot further where in 2017, you could raise money with an idea. Today, products are launching before they even raising a dime. Right. We've gone into, into a completely different world where now DeFi protocols are launching with live products before they ever raise a single dime. And that's truly a huge change because now we've gone from these idealists with visions and ideas to hardcore, you know, tech warriors that are actually deploying products that can be used and are being used and can actually change the world. We're no longer talking about changing the world. We are changing the world. And that is so powerful because ultimately that is what's going to lead to 2020 and 2021 and 2022 and 2023 being a much bigger bull cycle than we've ever seen before. Guys, with that, I think you can tell I couldn't be more optimistic and bullish on what's happening right now in the digital asset space because truly we've gone from ideas to products. We've gone from silos to interoperability. We've gone from deserts of no users to millions of users using platforms like MetaMask, like Uniswap, you name it, to billions of dollars in TBL on DeFi. It's truly a changed world and I couldn't be more excited because I was here when it was a dead world. It was a ghost town uh, during the bear market. And it's great to see all these projects and products finally going live, not just mainnet, but the amazing thing is that many of these products launched their mainnets perhaps in late 2019, early 2020, and many of them are already now launching their version twos. Some of them are launching their version threes. So as we're going towards launch and as we see more and more users adapt to the space, we are seeing an intense and insane acceleration of the pace because as products go live, valuations go up. As valuations go up, treasuries go up. As treasuries go up, teams can hire more devs. As teams hire more devs, they can develop faster. It's an amazing positive feedback loop and I'm truly here for it. So guys, if you enjoyed this video and you wanna dive deeper into the world of digital assets and decentralization, go check out our brand new course about the DeFi ecosystem. It's entirely free. You can find it at cryptoacademy.us slash DeFi, where we break down everything about you know, who are the big players, why is DeFi important, how is it accruing value, and so forth. No credit card required, no nothing. It's just free from me to you, a gift, because I want to educate more people to make sure that if my is flowing into this industry, I want it to flow to the right projects that are disturbing, that are building. Because the truth is, as we go into bull market, there will be more and more scams, there will be a lot more frauds. So I want to make sure that we really support the builders that are paving the roads of the future of a decentralized world. So with that, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.